Welcome back, everybody. It is time for us to head into fact number 31 of 35. And uh, we have a very exciting guest now, uh, someone who is currently a best selling author sitting in the charts with an absolutely brilliant book uh, that my wife has read three times. Uh, she's <laughs> read the audio book, she's got the hardback, and she's read the paperback, which is now currently sitting in the charts. It is brilliant. It's called The Book You Wish Your Parents Had Read, brackets, and your children will be glad that you did. It is, of course, the brilliant Philippa Perry. Hey! Hey, Philippa! Hey. Hi, oh, Philippa! Hi. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> and I've got the brilliant Kevin with me. Kevin! Today. Hi, Kevin. We're yeah. over here, Kevin. Kevin! Kevin! Uh, Kevin. Oh, I just hope he Kevin. doesn't kind of chew through a microphone lead or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing the show. And we are going to kick into your fact. So it's time for fact number 31. And that is Philippa. Okay, here is your fact. There are wild, wild cattle in England. <laughs> never been touched by human hands. Never seen a vet. And they hang out in the enclosed parkland at Chillingham. And they have done for at least 800 years. Wow. <laughs> Mad. Oh, they're wild. They're wild. That's the best delivered fact we've yeah, ever had. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> 31 in, we have a winner. <laughs> <laughs> so is this, these, are they, are they just really crafty? Are people trying to touch them and they're just evading? Well, their... they're a bit fierce. You wouldn't really want to get up close. Uh, but oh. they um, the half of them are bulls, half of them are cows, and they've all got massive great horns, and they're not afraid to use them. You can see the scars <laughs> on the side of the cows and the bulls as they repeatedly gore each other quite a lot. And, um, and their ancestors are probably uh, the wild cattle of Britain that Julius Caesar admired so much because, you know, they are, they are quite fierce and he liked them. Darwin was very keen on them as well. And he encouraged the uh, encumbrance of the estate to keep a record. So that's when a written record sort of formally started. But the, they have been uh, mentioned in literature from about 800 years ago, but we don't know how long they've they were there before then. Wow. Uh, Simon Sharma, not only Julius Caesar, but Simon Sharma thought um, <laughs> they were the great icon of British national history. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. They're like our equivalents of giant pandas, aren't they, for China? They're like so rare and you only get them here. Right. They're, they're a bit more fierce than the giant pandas. And they're more they rare as well, just because they're cows. Every, you know, it's sort of, oh, we, everywhere, everywhere has cows. These are definitely rarer than giant pandas. Are they? Yeah. Are they, do yeah, people they go in and view them like you would pandas? You in a can zoo? go on an escorted tour with a warden, which as soon as lockdown is over is on my, on my wish list. <laughs> um, what is really interesting about them is that... Um, there's only a hundred of them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in 1947, after a particularly vicious winter, there was only 14 of them. Wow. And they are so incredibly interbred that they shouldn't really survive at all. And that is a sort of scientific mystery, how this tiny gene pool is yeah. apparently thriving. Mm -hmm. And um, the latest batch of... Um, baby cows and bulls are so vicious that the warden has uh, nicknamed them the hoodies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, and one of the reasons they're so angry, I was reading an interview with um, Ellie Crossley, who is the first female warder of the Chillingham cattle. Uh, and she said basically, normal cattle have been bred to be more docile and to yeah. have certain characteristics but of course these guys are wild and they do what they want so we've never bred them that way and so this is closer to what the original cattle would have been like mm. and the most vicious ones obviously survive because they course, they're not afraid yeah. of goring each other to death wow so that's it doesn't matter if you're inbred if you have if you're also violent i think is what we're that's, saying i, I think we're saying. you usually go together so, you know I think it's, it's a lesson from european royal families <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean 
the family that owned the estate is uh, almost as wild as the cattle actually <laughs> <laughs> it was the gray family as in t um and oh. they've they've been on the land before records uh, began. I mean, their name changes sometimes because sometimes it goes down the female line. And sometimes they're called Bennets, and I think they've had a, <coughs> they've got an earldom and a few barons hanging around. Anyway, they are fairly wild. And during the War of the Roses, this family, uh, half of them were Lancastrian and half of them were Yorkist. And when the Lancastrians won the war, they had no no. Um, um, hesitation at all in decapitating brutally eight of their relatives because they were on the wrong side wow. <laughs> so they were as bad Sweet. as the cattle really aren't they? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yeah but the family that's there now it's um is it chillingham castle yes it's that's I, the I attached that... to the land it's dominic cummings's father-in-law who oh, owns the at the moment. Yeah, he's, uh, oh, what's he called? Is it Sir Humphrey <laughs> Wakefield? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, a wild bunch, I think. Isn't that where he, did? I thought he went to his father-in-law's house, or am I wrong about that? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I think it might be a bit of the castle. I can't remember for sure. I oh, but is that where he went? Like, I think it might Cummings? be. Wow, yeah. he could I, have just said he was looking after his cattle. <laughs> yeah, <it could laughs> that would have been, been a much better it, excuse. Except I would, no yeah. one does look after them. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> wild, James! <laughs> Other than they keep the boundary fence so that uh, no you know, stray genes can get in and they yeah. can't right. escape. But mm. apart from that, and I always keep people wanted, away. I always wanted to go and touch them. I must say, well, like, cheeky. Why? Well, because no one else, no, no one else has done it for eight hundred years. Who doesn't want to do something that well, no one else has done for eight hundred no years? No one's touched them, but unfortunately, <laughs> somebody did kill one. It wasn't me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in um, the Prince of Wales, who later became, oh, God, one of the Edwards. Oh, the uh, one after Victoria? Edward VII? Around about 1872, there was, <laughs> I mean, sometimes there is a king bull that sort of controls the whole herd. And sometimes the bulls break out into mini kingdoms and they're sort of, but there was a massive king bull in 1872, I think. And the uh, the Duke thought he'd suck up to the royal family and he, the Prince of Wales was allowed to kill the King Bull for sport. Uh, Boo! Uh, Boo! Uh, Boo. <laughs> I think that did happen a bit, although we don't touch them now. I, when you look them up in sort of the oldie newspapers from the 19th century, hunting the Chillingham cattle does seem to be a thing posh people were doing. Mm. There, was, there was a description in the 1880s in one article of a tour party at the castle who I think were saying they'd heard the you know king in waiting had done it and they wanted to hunt one of these cattle and a group of men had a bit to drink and one of them showing off said i'm gonna go i've shot a buffalo before i'm gonna go and shoot one of these cattle but he it described him as shooting this cat this cat this bull multiple times didn't kill it just stood there so it didn't look it didn't move away didn't flinch just stood wow. there shot it multiple times and then eventually charged him and quite a re revolting description of it tearing the innards out of his horse <gasps> and then uh he failed to kill the bull but so good on those bulls for defending themselves. Yeah, wow. don't, me don't mess with the bulls. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I think, you know, to leave a herd of animals alone is actually quite good for us because we're usually interfering far too much. I don't know if you think we anthropomorphise animals too much, but when I first moved to this house, there were feral cats everywhere and I bloody loved them. And they seemed to sort of survive okay. I mean, they didn't have very long lives or anything. But now there's so many animal charities that go around castrating cats and, you know, making sure they, they've got a enough kitty cat or whatever. That we're sort of losing the wildness of our animals. And I think I might be patron of one of these charities. So I'm being, you know, terribly... <laughs> Great. You, you think? I don't think you will be for long, folks. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> but do you think that, you know, we should just let be a bit more and stop thinking, oh, you need to go to the vet? Because, yeah. Know. Yeah, maybe. It's a very yeah. tempting idea. I did, So, Philip, you mentioned the Edward VII 
chancellor who killed the king bull. Um, yeah. So the only reason he was able to do it was because he was hidden in a hay cart at the time that he oh, made wow. the shot. And there was a, it went down so badly with uh, the locals, who I think were more of your mind on this opinion, yeah. that a local poet who called Robert Elliot wrote a poem about it. And I just want to tell you four lines because they're so <laughs> William McGonagall bad. I love it. Um, okay. The lines are, and it, they're in the original dialect, and I'm going to try and render it. He's a warrior, ye na, and the papers are full. If a terrible encounter he had with a bull, he slaughtered the bull, but his critics will say that the prince was concealed in a bundle of hay. Wow, that wow. was nice. I'm good, eh? Fantastic. <laughs> what was that, Andy? What? Sorry, I missed, I missed why you... What was that? I, I'm not sure what the claw I did most yeah. of was <laughs> that was for, for effect. I was quite distracted by that, yeah. Like, oh, this is character acting. Yeah. Anyway. So if James went and touched it, I think, think we should encourage a lot of people to. James has now bagsied it, so we'll leave it at that. Is it, could James get in trouble? Are they sort of, you know, parkland well, protected species? They, or? they they police themselves. So if you go and touch them, you might get gored because yeah, they really take kindly to, to humans. I touch them with around. a drone. Why they are particularly vicious is that, unlike a lot of animals, is that they don't have a mating se uh, season. They rut all year round. So they're always oh. on sort of alert. And so the bulls are always challenging each other. But they've always got sort of extra doses of testosterone hanging about. So um, it's most unusual because most, you know, um, animals have a sort of mating season and even yeah. us humans if we're all in a if we all start living together we all tend to uh, ovulate at the same time we have our own little mating seasons but not this lot maybe because they're so antisocial and, and vicious with each other that they don't the, the cows don't get close enough to us uh, um to synchronize, to synchronize what, their periods I don't what know, a hectic so. life that is that every morning they're all waking up <laughs> all the male are waking up looking at each other going the fuck you looking at <laughs> <laughs> what a kind of life technically as humans you're all on mating season all the time as well you you lads um, oi, oi. So you're all waking up like that as well, right? <laughs> humans much like these bulls. It's it getting a bit out of control. Like... It yeah. is. It's getting out of control. Like actually. after 20 hours of podcasting, it has to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, God. No. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of challenges to me going over and touching these cows, so maybe I'll, I might get No, it. James, stick to your truth. You have to, <laughs> you have to do it. Uh, right, what what pledges can we get of money for comic relief if James goes and is almost certainly gored to death by a shaving cow? Can we get I another five thousand pounds? The warden will gore you to death before you get anywhere near. What's them? Dominic Cummings' dad gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> They're above um, that sort of thing, aren't they? <laughs> You yeah. know, there is there is one other place where these Chillingham cattle live, and it's kind of the reserve ultra backup storage system for this gene pool. Oh, and really? I think it was, Philippa, you said there was, in 1947, was it? There was this terrible winter and there were only 14 Yeah, left. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once that happened, they they decided, this is, this is mad, having this entire subspecies here. We can't just do this. So in somewhere in Scotland, and they won't say where, it's, I think, somewhere on the Queen's land uh, in Scotland, which doesn't really narrow it down very much, obviously. <laughs> um, but there are, there are just 25 more. Uh, oh, really? and, I and they're working that, really. they're working on a kind of a, i think a frozen kind of embryo storage like the han solo oh, so they are things. getting interfered with by vets mm. i think oh, that's just the ultra backup yeah we let it lie can we we're always interfering <laughs> with animals we know best i want to see your speech at the next fundraiser for the cat castration <laughs> charity that you're the patron <laughs> of Philippa. i can't wait i think, <laughs> I, think should... I might be sacked after this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you remember the thing with all the tea in the UK got hidden in 500 different locations during the war? Yeah, yeah World War II. Yeah. Get along, they wouldn't get all of our tea and we'd be able to hide some of it. They should do that with these cows. Just take, you know, a thousand of them, two in a different field everywhere yeah. in the country. Yeah, because it sounds like they hate each other anyway, so they're not getting lonely, <laughs> are they? <laughs> I think it would be a great idea if we had them as sort of backup army, a sort of like you know, alternative... <laughs> Last line of defence. Yeah. yeah. Actually, there are some Nazi cows in the UK. 
at the moment. Oh, are there? Yeah, there are. So these are called Heck Super Cows. They're originally bred by German zoologists Heinz and Lutz Heck, and the Nazis commissioned them to try and get back to the aurochs, which were like old cattle before they were. Oh yeah, uh, really kind uh, of primordial. Animal. Yeah, and yeah. so they did all this work in the 30s and 40s to try and get this perfect kind of cattle, and now it's a separate subspecies. And there are some of them in the UK at the moment. There's a guy called Mr. Gao which sounds so much like Mr. Cow. <laughs> I'm so upset he's not called Mr. Cow. He's called Mr. Cow. <laughs> uh, and he has some of them in Devon. He has 13 of them. Uh, actually, wow. he's got 20 of them now. Uh, oh, really? And then every now and then the Daily Mail get very upset about them <laughs> because of oh. Nazi super cow. Well, what are they up to? <laughs> well, they might be after our Chillingham cattle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Counter-attack. Yeah, it could be like a kind of a war recreation between the <laughs> cattle and the Nazi cattle. <laughs> there, well, there, to- is, there is a um, uh, rumour that, in fact, the Chilean cattle may have been brought over by Julius Caesar. I mean, he had mad oh. our wild cattle, but perhaps they sort of mated with his cattle that he brought over from Italy because they used to like um, sacrificing the odd uh, bovine bit of species on Hadrian's wall for some reason, probably why it stood up for so long. So maybe (laughs) our Chilean cattle aren't aren't that native. Maybe Julius Caesar brought over some bull semen for that lot. I just... Guessing. <laughs> Sorry, this is a factoid program. Yeah. <laughs> when he says, I came, I saw, I conquered, the came part was. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, they so nearly got foot and mouthed in 2001. That was a really wow, scary okay. moment. Yeah, it got to within four miles of the Chillingham cattle. Wow. And I don't think they had any protection naturally against it. So they had to suddenly remove all the sheep from the park, because there are a few sheep in there, put up extra yeah. fencing, total biosecurity lockdown. So, yeah, and, it, and the, it was fine. They managed to keep it out. So to That was a bit jeopardy. of human interference, but perhaps it's because of human interference that we've got foot and mouth in the first place. So we'll let we'll let that go, Ah, uh, yeah, it cancels <laughs> itself out. Yeah. yeah, I like that. You're not willing to give us any credit, are you, Philippa? With, you know. I am giving you so much credit for all the research you've done. I mean, I just thought, <laughs> I've heard of these cattle and looked up an article on Wikipedia, but you, you've gone through old newspapers. You are very <laughs> <impressive>. <laughs> We did have a, a kind of hate day of valuing cattle though didn't we in in sort of like 18th to 19th century and which artist was it who led the way and was the oh. artist who drew huge square cows you could barely see their legs They're oh like, yeah, yeah 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 um, was it Lancer or Stubbs, Did Stubbs. 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 yeah exactly those guys and we started breeding or the English started breeding cows to be these enormous sizes I think the average size of a cow almost doubled in the 18th century. <laughs> yeah, That's incredible. Now, cause... Yeah. That must be amazing, like time travel thing. If you went forward in time and suddenly all the cows were twice as big as everything else is the same, but all the cows. <laughs> <Yeah>. are... <laughs> well, funny you should say that because one of the things I've been keeping an eye on during the lockdown are people's dreams. And there's a new sort of breed of dream coming when people are dreaming of just enormous domestic domesticated animals like pigs oh, cows really? and, no. yeah yeah there's and you know i had a dream of a giant pig that i had to look after and it was a bit unwieldy and difficult and nobody would help me but i did a sort of unscientific twitter survey and facebook survey of dreams and i've come across about 20 dreams of people dreaming of extra large sort of not pets, but sort of domesticated animals. Uh, that what do you think it might mean? Have you put it to anything yet? Well, I think what it could be is that uh, a lot of people are burdened at the moment with sort of like having to work from home, homeschool, look after the children, pay the mortgage on a reduced income. And so the domestic burden has got much bigger and uh, it might feel like we've got this massive great pig to look after. Mm. I was looking after this pig in my, in my sleep. And in my sleep, 
Grayson told me it wasn't a pig, it was a sheep. I got so angry. (laughs) (laughs) Shouted at him when I woke up. (laughs) 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 But uh, a lot lot of people are dreaming about giant cattle as well. Right. Very interesting. I like your interpretation because I thought it might be that pets are just the only thing we care about now. They're so big in our lives because we've got nothing else. It's all anyone talks about. Oh, like they've got We'd... bigger in yeah. proportion to how much we're yeah. seeing of them. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah, that's I nice. Um, Maybe a lot more people are drinking a lot more alcohol than they used to. That is a yeah. factor, <laughs> but it's no doubt contributing. Uh, one lady sent me a picture of a giant cat, and she was asleep on the back of her cat. I thought so. You know, that's how they've they've become together. Like the cat is so big in her life. Yeah. Right. There you go. The big cattle, was this, I think we spoke about this a while ago, was this that period where it became such a sign of of wealthiness um in the UK that you would have your portrait painted standing next to a big cow? Yeah. Even if yeah. it wasn't yours, you would sort of yeah. go to a field, find a massive cow, and just, here's me and a big cow. It's, like, like, it's a bit so- like posing in front of a Maserati or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like Elsa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they used to have this the weird thing that, um, so they'd sell for huge amounts of money then. And still, when you have auctions for pedigree stock, so not when you're just selling farm animals, but like precious cattle, it's done in guineas which oh, yeah. I didn't know until recently. So you'll be at the auction and it's um, it'll be a guinea and a sh- and guineas and shillings. Is that a pound right? and a shilling is one guinea. It's a pound yeah. and a shilling. So that's uh, 105p is a guinea, isn't we it? We got told on Twitter, I don't know if this is right, but when we mentioned this on the podcast, they said that the pound is the price and then the extra shilling goes to the auctioneer and that's why they do it. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a right. tip, isn't it? But you should just do yeah. one pound five because otherwise <laughs> you sound like it's an auction 200 years ago <laughs> <laughs> but then that gives it a sort of gravitas and a bit makes it a bit yeah. more posh yeah. yeah make the cattle more desirable in some yes. way if that you yeah. paid for it in a yeah game, yeah hey have you guys heard of the rare breed survival trust no. No. they're so good philippa you're looking for a new charity roundabout now and maybe <laughs> you should get involved with these guys um basically they they monitor all the creatures so the chilling cattle are, are on the list and it's it's all the creatures that they know there are very few breeding stock left off so the and this is in the uk only i think so there's the very rare badger face sheep um <laughs> that's that's the badger face mountain sheep society the Does old english one, if you see that Without the body, do you think it's a badger? Or... I bet you do. Yeah. I bet you do. If it just pokes its head through the hedgerow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. Um, the large black pig, very rare apparently. The golden Guernsey goat. The rumpless game chicken. These are all <laughs> desperately endangered in the UK. Wow. And they, we we need to preserve them. You know? They feel well, like what? rare Pokemon or something. Can you collect them? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, there was a black completely black fox uh, spotted in Middlesex recently running around the streets actually in the town uh, I think I think I don't know Gerard's Cross or somewhere it's amazing isn't it I yeah. want a black fox we want more we... black foxes are they on the list you know, I just realized Philippa when that story came out and it is stunning that fox so exciting yeah. and I thought about it all day I thought I'd love to see it and I had a dream about that black fox but it was very big it was sort no. of a half an hour <laughs> in my garden You're about kidding. a week and a half ago. Really? Yeah. Had you been drinking heavily? <laughs> and you know I never do. So. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to avoid psychology for this um, podcast because I needed a break, but I think we're on the collective unconscious now. Yeah. Yeah. Animals, we've, uh, we've lost our sort of... We can't go up to people and touch them, touch them and, and sort of be among them. So maybe that's why animals are becoming more and more important. Even your yeah. big fox, big which fox. obviously stands for a part of your inner fox. Oh, yeah. You know, you have got an inner fox sub-personality that's huge, apparently. Yeah. That's why you're always rooted around the bins, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stop shitting on my bins as well. <laughs> I'm sorry for shrieking all through the night, by the way, everyone in London. Um, well, Philippa, you may be kicked out from your charity, but you've done something awesome for us here today because we've just hit £100,000. Yeah. Um, 
we can stop. <laughs> See you later, guys. Um, and uh, when the when the parks open again, we can all uh, go to Chillingham and look at the cattle respectfully from afar. That would be yes. fun. Yeah. Well, we're going to need another Good podcast luck. member once uh, James has to go. So, Philippa, if you're free. <laughs> oh, I'm, as long as you don't mind that my facts are all from Wikipedia, I'm in. <laughs> 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 well, um, I think we'll uh, we'll say goodbye to you now. It was so fun having you. Uh, thank you so much. Really? Um, you've tipped us over to the hundred thousand. That is so that's cool. Great. Yeah, um, that's that would have been my mum, but she's dead, so I don't know who it is. So that's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for having me. And, thanks so uh, much. <laughs> factoids. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, we will be back in a couple of minutes with our next guests. Uh, we've got two of them coming on. It is the brilliant Sally Phillips and Ronnie Ancona. We'll see you in a sec. <laughs> Hello, everybody. That was fun, wasn't it? Well, now you have to pay. Please, please go to comicrelief.com slash fish and give us all of your money so that it can be spent on fabulous causes around the world. There are many more videos where these came from. So bring all of your money and give it to us. Link is below. Click on the link.